Good afternoon. Welcome to noontime worship on this Good Friday. My name is Dalton Rushing. I'm one of the pastors here. It's a real pleasure to be in worship with you today. I'm grateful for those of you who are here, whether you're worshiping in person or whether you've been worshiping online, and really grateful for those who have helped pull off these services and the good lunches that have followed them this week. This uh, series of ecumenical services is a longtime tradition here at Decatur First United Methodist Church, and I am so glad we've been able to continue them after a couple of year hiatus. On this Good Friday, we have, uh, uh, how shall I say this, the best preacher who lives in my house is preaching for us today. Uh, that's the Reverend Stacy Rushing, who is the associate pastor at Chambly United Methodist Church. Uh, she's no stranger uh, around here, as she happens to be my wife. And I'm grateful, Stacy, that you're here. Thank you for uh, coming today. Friends, I invite you now to stand as you're able for our call to worship. In remembrance, we gather to be with the one who teaches us the meaning of faithfulness. In the name of the Son, lifting our voices to the one who calls us to love one another. In remembrance, we feast, breaking the bread which makes us whole, drinking the cup which fills us with grace. Our opening hymn is number 288 in the United Methodist Hymnal. It is Were You There? Let's sing together.
You may be seated. Please join me now in our congregational prayer. Everlasting God, because of your tender mercy toward all people, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon himself our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, that all should follow the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may follow the example of his patience and also be made partakers of his resurrection through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good afternoon. I appreciate the invitation to be with you all again. It has been some number of years since I have stood here during the Holy Week service. It is nice to be with my extended church family. I know we don't see each other weekly, but I hear about you and I see some of you throughout the week. <laughs> good things, all good things. <laughs> And I am blessed to be with all of the ministers on staff here. You have a wonderful team at Decatur First, and I always so enjoy being with my siblings who share this common calling. Today is Good Friday, and we will hear from Jesus' passion story today from the Gospel of Mark, and we are going to begin at the 15th chapter. Hear now the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At daybreak, the chief priest with the elders, legal experts, and the whole Sanhedrin formed a plan. They bound Jesus, led him away, and turned him over to Pilate. 
Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, That's what you say. The chief priests were accusing him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Aren't you going to answer? What about all these accusations? But Jesus gave no more answers, so that Pilate marveled. During the festival, Pilate released one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. A man named Barabbas was locked up with the rebels who had committed murder during the uprising. The crowd pushed forward and asked Pilate to release someone, as he regularly did. Pilate answered them, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? He knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of jealousy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate replied, Then what do you want me to do with the one you call king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done wrong? They shouted even louder, Crucify him! Pilate wanted to satisfy the crowd, so he released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus whipped, then handed over to them to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the courtyard of the palace known as the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole company of soldiers. They dressed him up in a purple robe and twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on him. They saluted him, "'Hey, King of the Jews!' Again, they struck his head with a stick. They spit on him, and they knelt before him to honor him. When they finished mocking him, they stripped him of the purple robe and put his clothes back on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Simon, a man from Serene, Alexander and Rufus's father, was coming in from the countryside. They forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means skull place. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. They crucified him. They divided up his clothes, drawing lots for them to determine who would take what. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the formal charges against him was written, the king of the Jews. They crucified two other outlaws with him, one on his right and one on his left. People walking by insulted him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha! So you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, were you? Save yourself and come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests were making fun of him among themselves together with the legal experts. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross. Then we'll see and believe. Even those who had been crucified with Jesus insulted him. From noon until three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At three, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you left me? After hearing him, some standing with him said, Look, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink, saying, Let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and died. The curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing Jesus saw how he died, He said, this man was certainly God's son. Some women were watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger one, and Jose and Salome. When Jesus was in Galilee, these women had followed and supported him along with many other women who had come to Jerusalem with him. Since it was late in the afternoon on the day of preparation, just before the Sabbath, Joseph from Arimathea dared to approach Pilate and ask for Jesus' body. Joseph was a prominent council member who was also eagerly anticipated the coming of God's kingdom. Pilate wondered if Jesus was already dead. 
he called the centurion and asked him whether Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, Pilate gave the dead body to Joseph. He brought a linen cloth, took Jesus down from the cross, wrapped him in the cloth, and laid him in a tomb that had been carved out of rock. He rolled a stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was buried. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The paradox of today is right there in its name, Good Friday. The Friday part we get because that's the day of the week we're at. It's the good part that's hard to understand. It's the good part that makes me bristle. It, it feels like someone running their fingernails down a chalkboard. It's offsetting. It's disturbing. And it's deeply appropriate. Today is a day where two truths which feel completely at odds come together in a painful yet necessary way. For me, the words of Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, say it best in the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? or thorns can pose so rich a crown. The idea that on the day that Jesus is crucified, we would use the word good doesn't make sense in our increasingly polarized world. We need things to be one or the other. They are either good or they are bad. They are left, they are right. You are for us or you are against us. As a society, we have become so good at othering people or groups that it's really hard to get to a place where something as awful as the account of Jesus' crucifixion, complete with jeering crowds, taunts, and bitter wine, would be anywhere close to being called good. Now, the truth is that those who dive deep into the details of scripture and of liturgy and of the church have researched how we came to this word good for this day, Good Friday. And the truth is that it's probably some derivative of a translation that came to be known as God's Friday, and somehow we got it all mixed up and Good Friday stuck for us. In fact, in other parts of the world, they don't even call it Good Friday. It's called Holy Friday. They leave the goodness off completely. But can I be honest with you today? As much as I think that it makes me cringe that we would call this day good, there is a part deep within me that needs this reminder, that actually kind of values this space, that the word good carves out for us as Christians. Because I need to be set on edge a little bit to sit in that deep discomfort where I have to remember that the truth is that in our world, whether we like it or not, love and sorrow do in fact meet. That in that gut-wrenching scene on the cross, we find life-redeeming grace. That in our world, in this very moment, two truths can exist. That we are loved unconditionally by God and bad things happen. In our life, that which makes our heart sore is connected to that which makes our hearts break. Good Friday reminds us of this, that the very love that would save us from our sin comes with the great sorrow of seeing our Savior crucified. In the poem on joy and sorrow by Khalil Gibran, he speaks of it in this way. Your joy is your sorrow unmasked. And the self-same well from which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with your tears. And how else can it be? The deeper your sorrow carves into your being, the more joy it can contain. 
Is not the cup that holds your wine the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? And is not the lute that soothes your spirit the very wood that was hollowed with knives? When you are joyous, look deep into your heart, and you shall find it is only that which has given you sorrow that is giving you joy. When you are sorrowful, look again into your heart, and you shall see that in truth you are weeping for that which has been your delight. The paradox of goodness that we find ourselves within today is a reminder that in our lives and in our faith, joy and sorrow meet, opening us to the realization that they were never that far apart to begin with. What's more, if today we can open ourselves to that possibility that love and sorrow can coexist in the cross, we can understand a necessary truth about who we are as humans. We can hear the words of Mark's gospel, which cut so quickly to the harsh reality of that day. We are invited to sit in this gospel, to hear the truth that we see in ourselves two people in this story, that we can see ourselves in two different places. We are both the crowds shouting, crucify him, and the women watching horrified in the distance. In each one of us, there is the capacity to bring God great sorrow when we hurt one another, when we fail to show mercy by our action or inaction, when we fail to see God's image in another person. And yet in that same person, there is the capacity to love as God loves. Life then for us may swing at times from the very joyful to the very sorrowful, like a pendulum, but remain grounded in that same center point that central point, which is God. And on Good Friday, we look towards that point and we see God and we see on each end the joy and the sorrow. And we understand that truth, which the Apostle Paul wrote, that God caused the one who did not know sin to be sin for our sake, so that through him we could become the righteousness of God. Now, I feel like I shouldn't fail to say that there is a temptation for all of us in Good Friday, as there often is in difficult moments and difficult seasons when the world around us seems to be broken, to numb the sorrow, to flee from it, or maybe to ignore it completely and push forward towards Easter because we know what's coming. Something really good lies ahead. But I would caution us not to too quickly depart from the sorrow. Because if we leave behind the Friday and only hold on to the good, we miss something. Just like if we let go of the good and only hold on to the Friday, we leave something important behind. We as Christians are called to be people who can sit in this space, who can make room for both truths in our lives and in our world. Because we know that love and sorrow do meet. That in our world we can see people fleeing violence and our heart can break and we can be compelled by love to respond. We can see someone on the sidewalk begging for food and our heart can break and fill with sorrow and we can wonder how this could exist. And yet we could let love creep in and inspire us to respond, to follow Jesus, even to the cross. Yes, if on this Good Friday we can make space where love and sorrow can meet, then maybe, just maybe, even in the darkness of this hour, we can glimpse 
the mystery of God. That is my prayer for us. Today, as we go from this time, as we remember the death of Jesus, as we look forward to the resurrection, as we commit ourselves to being people of faith. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend Stacy. We are delighted to hear from another rushing today. Uh, <laughs> 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 Friends, we, uh, our spirits have been filled, and now we invite you to fill your bellies outside underneath the tent. If you'll go through the narthex, we will enjoy food and fellowship together. Let us bless our meal. God of love on this holy and good Friday, we remember the lengths to which your love will go to reach us. There is nothing, nothing, not even death that can separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ. And we are so grateful. Please now bless this meal and the conversations that we will have to nourish our bodies and minds. May it empower us to go out into the world with love and compassion. Amen. Go in peace.